The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Centered in Christ. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for all thy grace to us. Bless thy word as it goes forth, and use it to open the eyes of the blind, and to strengthen thy children. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We come now to the 15th verse of Romans 8. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You see, our new position as children of God through faith in Christ Jesus brings with it a great number of blessings, some of which are absolute transformations. And this is why our text begins with the word for. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. This word is a hinge that ties the whole passage together. We have been brought out of death and into life. We have been established in Christ as a new pivot around which all life is to revolve. It should be noticed that this is the fourth consecutive verse that begins with the word for or therefore. Going back through this chain to the 11th verse, we find that it all centers in the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the greater fact for us, that when God raised our Lord from the dead, he raised us up together with him. Therefore, we are debtors. Because if we live after the flesh, the Christian life will be defeat and not triumph. But the triumph is assured because as many as are dominated by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Because we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. For there was a time when God brought his chosen people out of Egypt and put them into bondage under the law. And that spirit of bondage brought great fear to their hearts but we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. If we read the epistle to the Hebrews carefully, we shall discover this contrast set forth in an extraordinary way. Many people have misunderstood the great epistle to the Hebrews because they have somehow ignored its title. The epistle to the Hebrews was written to the Hebrews in order to show the Hebrews that they had to stop being Hebrews. Now, when that truth is understood, a score of passages that seem obscure in that epistle immediately become crystal clear. The spirit of bondage to fear is removed, and the believer stands forth as eternally established in Christ. After presenting the deity of the Lord Jesus in the first chapter of Hebrews, the writer sets forth the fact that because of the Godhead of the Savior Son of God, a failure to receive him would be followed by severe judgment. For if the law given through angels on Mount Sinai was an unmovable code, and if every transgression and disobedience received its proper punishment, how can any man escape who neglects the greater truth that is brought through Jesus Christ? Now the giving of that law through Moses was a fearful and an awesome thing. The children of Israel were encamped at the base of the mountain, and it was fenced off from them and their animals while Moses went up to meet with God and receive the tables of the law. God surrounded the mountain with impenetrable coverings of cloud and darkness, and there were violent phenomena of nature, which caused great fear to the hearts of the people. We read in Hebrews 12 that Mount Sinai was a mount that might be touched, but that it burned with fire and was surrounded with blackness and darkness and tempest. Furthermore, there was the sounding of the angelic trumpet, which struck fear into the hearts of the people. A voice was heard which spoke words, but whether or not the people understood the words, they cried out that the word should not be spoken unto them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, the commandment was given that the animal should be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And the fear which came with the giving of the law was not merely in the hearts of the people who were in the camp. For so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Now Moses had received the spirit of bondage to fear. It had to be so with the law of God that was perfect. That was the revelation, not only of the holiness of God, 
but of the righteousness which he was forced to demand of those who approached him. No deviation could be permitted by the God whose standard had to be the standard of absolute perfection. The thundering voice had to conclude by summing it up in words of condemnation. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah, and thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and beware lest thou forget Jehovah, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear Jehovah thy God and serve him, and shalt swear by his name, Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For Jehovah thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of Jehovah thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. No wonder they were frightened almost to the point of death. For they had been bound to a law that it was absolutely impossible to keep and they had been given standards that were utterly impossible to attain. They knew, moreover, that God was perfect, and that they were sinners, and they were filled with fear, because they knew that they would have to face him. And there was nothing that could take away the fear that was in their relationship of bondage. It was true that the blood sacrifices of the old covenant provided the basis whereby God, in his righteousness, could look upon this people as being justified. He could see through the outward sacrifices in which he had had no pleasure. He could see through to the incarnation and death of his own dear son, his son in whom he was well pleased, and could know that he was both just and the justifier of those who believed him. But none of this could quiet the conscience of the people who believed him and who brought the sacrifices which the law demanded. The ritual of the sacrifices was planned in such a way as to leave the worshippers with the uneasiness of conscience that went with the concept of a God who was distant because of their sins. Thus, the high priest never went into the Holy of Holies except once a year, on the Day of Atonement. The Holy Spirit thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle that of the Mosaic Covenant, was yet standing, for it was a figure of the time of that dispensation in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Oh, our poet was quite correct, therefore, in writing the hymn which begins, Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. Oh, thank God he was able to continue to show that Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away. Furthermore, the word of God plainly states that the bringing in of the better hope of the new covenant has made it possible for the fires of conscience to be stilled forever so that the believer can now walk freely before God without the slightest fear. For in Hebrews 9 we read, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God? It is not difficult to understand why God ordered the old covenant as he did. The human race had fallen in Adam and had fallen so much farther than man could imagine in his pride that it was necessary to teach him 
slowly and painstakingly the grandeur of the holiness of God, and on the other hand, the intrinsic evil of sin. It was when the people were confronted by these two truths that they were gripped by their conscience and brought to fear. The pagan world around them lived in the utmost horror of fear. They were born into a world of superstitions and lived looking over their shoulder at every sound and being startled by every shadow. Little by little, they came to imagine a god of some sort living in every bush and behind every stone. As the population moved to towns and cities, they brought the images of these gods to every wall and corner and to every public place. In the country, they set up simple shrines at every boundary mark and looked for the gods in every hill and stream. The difference between the other nations and Israel is that Israel came to know with a very solid certainty that their God, Jehovah, had more power than all of the other gods put together. They knew that as long as they continued to acknowledge him and to perform the sacrifices which he demanded, they remained safe and protected. But they soon found that it was not within their lustful hearts and straying minds to remain faithful to a God who abhorred images and other visible signs of religion, but who called upon people to worship him from the heart. They speedily departed to those religions which satisfied the flesh, and thus drew upon themselves a just condemnation. Thus, individually and nationally, they were made aware of the judgments of God, and the fear of torment within and chastisement without hung over them throughout all their bondage. Now our text announces plainly that the believer in Christ is not to live in any such state of fear. We have received the life of Christ, the resurrection life of our Lord, and thus we are to live in freedom far from the fear that conscience inspires. Goodspeed has translated our text this way. It is not a consciousness of servitude that has been imparted to you to fill you with fear again, while the RSV renders it, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Oh, is it not a great tragedy, therefore, in the light of this truth that the church has been brought back under the law in so many cases? For wherever there is legalism, there must of necessity be the spirit of bondage to fear. It is heart-rending to read the history of the church and to find the constant tendency to return to the bondage of the law. On the pages of the New Testament, we discover that there were men from Jerusalem who followed hard on the steps of Paul to tear down that which he was preaching. He would arrive in a community and proclaim the doctrine of grace. He would tell men that they could trust in Christ and know that all of their sins were removed, both those which they had already committed and those that would be committed during the balance of life. For justification can mean nothing less than this, that a believer is received by God in the totality of his lifespan and that he is instantly made accepted in the Beloved. Paul would leave a little group of believers established in this truth, and men would arrive from Jerusalem to tell them that they were mistaken. Surely, they would argue, you must have some part in your salvation. Surely, they would declare, your good works must have some place in the divine plan. And the poor babes in Christ would turn their eyes away from the finished work of the cross and from the open tomb and the cloud ascent. They would look away from the throne of God, where Christ, their surety, was seated at the right hand of God, and they would begin to contemplate their own doings. And in that moment, they fell back into the spirit of bondage again unto fear. Paul writes to the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we 
or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as though this were not enough, the Holy Spirit clinches it by a strong repetition. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The context of the whole epistle to the Galatians shows that this other gospel, which was introduced by these legalizers, was the mixture of law with grace and the preaching that it was necessary to believe in Christ for salvation plus the performance of certain ritual obligations, such as circumcision, Sabbath-keeping, and similar outward forms. The battle for salvation by grace alone was fully won in the epistle to the Galatians, but the tendency to relapse has been a marked one throughout the centuries. At times it seemed as though the entire church was gripped by the accursed doctrine which reduces the believer once more to the state of bondage and fear. But always God has had his remnant, and the cycles of legalism have been followed by great periods of revival in grace. At one of the blackest moments in the history of mankind, Martin Luther arose and brought back the truth into the church, taking men away from the spirit of bondage and fear into the glorious liberty of the children of God. But even the reformers were afraid at times of the consequences of their teachings. We find that their followers created liturgies which assumed that the law of Moses had some place in the life of the church and that the believer who had received the bestowal of divine grace in full and free salvation was thereupon called to subjugate himself to some system that practically nullified grace and brought back the reign of fear. How many true children of God live in perpetual doubt, not daring to step out on the firm promises of God, not willing to claim the truths of their sonship, living a trembling life of doubting hope instead of the trusting life of strong affirmation based on the word of God who cannot lie. The result has been the growth of thousands of churches where Christians gather on Sunday mornings to go through an hour's service that has in it little more than the public acknowledgement of the greatness of God and our creature subjection to him, but which does not have the deep-rooted joy of a worship that is overflowing with love from those who rest in the knowledge of their justification and their eternal sonship. At the other swing of the pendulum, there are churches which started out by being very fundamental in doctrine, but which arrived at a new bondage of legalism through establishing a code of practices for Christians which could never, never be justified by the Bible, making a list of things from which their members promised to abstain. We have colleges and Bible schools which have adopted similar codes for their students, thus building hothouse plants instead of strong oaks, and in the case of many weak Christians, building hypocrites. The contrast in our text is that between the slave and the son. The one who is in bondage can never render anything more than the service of a slave. But the one who is truly joined to Christ has been brought into the position where it's possible for him to render the service of a son. Even now it is necessary for us to see that the truth, our text, while linked backwards to our union in the resurrection life of Christ by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is also linked forwards to our position as sons and the tremendous outgrowth of power, responsibility, and authority which is ours because of that oneness with Christ. Where there was alienation from God, there is now reconciliation with God. His face had been against us. It is now toward us. Where there was distance from God, there is now nearness. We who were once afar off have been made near by the death of Christ. Where there was once bondage, there is now freedom. Moreover, we are to stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and no longer be entangled in the yoke of bondage. Where there was condemnation, there is now justification. The judge has absolutely nothing against us 
because the full debt of sin was paid by Christ, and God is not unrighteous to seek a second payment from us. Where there was the speechlessness of guilt that shut our mouths completely, there is now glad prayer that speaks freely to the Father with the artless simplicity of a child who knows no barriers. Where there was doubt, there is now confidence. We once were in ignorance, but have been given an understanding that we might know him that is true and the things that are freely given to us in him. Where there was once hesitation, there is now holy boldness. We come through the new and living way into the holiest of all with no thought of rejection, but with the confidence of faith. Where there was once wavering, there is now certainty. We have been built into the eternal rock and made a part of Christ. We have the full assurance of faith. And where there was once fear, there is now love. His perfect love has cast out fear, for fear hath torment. But there is no fear in love. Let us therefore, in the light of all the contrasts which our God has set before us in his word, hold fast to him in the full assurance of life in Christ and have no fear except the godly fear of relapsing into a bondage that will bring us into ungodly fear. At the risk of being misunderstood, I believe that I may say that I have a greater fear, a godly fear, of falling from grace into some form of legalism than I have of falling into some kind of sin. For if I should fall into some form of sin, and I pray God moment by moment to be kept from such a fall, I know that I will have fallen into the loving arms of his forgiveness, and that he will restore me to fellowship and joy when I cry to him and confess my sin with a real desire of forsaking it. But if I fall into some bondage of legalism, I have denied all the processes of grace wherein I must stand and while in that bondage can have none of the fruits of grace. Let us therefore fear in a godly fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For you are not meant to relapse into the old slavish attitude of fear. You have been adopted into the very family circle of God, and you can say with a full heart, Father, my Father. And our God, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall teach us in this hour. And unto thee be all the glory and the majesty, the dominion and the power, now till our Lord Jesus come again and forever. Amen.